So we just locked up the trail camera survey that we've been working on. Uh, I don't know, the, the results were exciting. It's, it's fun, it's, it's always super exciting to do this stuff. I love doing it. Uh, you always think you're gonna find like that 200 inch year that just like never showed up all season, you'd never seen before. But every time you throw 10 cameras out in the woods for extended two weeks and throw corn everywhere, you never know what you're gonna pick up. Uh, sadly, none of that happened, but like we still got some awesome pictures. Definitely got some of the deer we we're looking for. The deer that we wanted to survive, they are still out there. So that's, that is great news for us uh, in the coming season. Um, something that we've been tracking for a while for us is fawn recruitment. And we, I mean, a winter survey is not going to pull in fawn recruitment as a big factor. Um, but it is showing you the net results. Like you do an early, uh, late summer survey and you're going to see the fawns hitting the ground. Um, but we're now tracking how many fawns are we seeing now. And sometimes it's difficult with young yearling bucks and everything, but like you can definitely pick out the fawns versus that. And uh, we've been tracking historically low. I mean, we're in middle Tennessee and I always look at the deer population numbers just to kind of give a baseline. And so like, you can look right here in these two areas. I use this as a category to give you estimates on is my numbers factual? Like you're never gonna produce you know, a hundred deer per square mile, you screwed up. Like that's just a known thing. Uh, and so, unless you're like in somewhere like Wisconsin where there's industry data to support your findings, I always like to back my, what I see, what I've gone through in my numbers to tell me what I saw makes sense. And so like my industry data, deer per square mile, and then deer per acre, all stats that most DNRs down to counties will tell you. Uh, to give you a good estimate, are you in the ballpark? Or are you above and below? And if you're like two or three standard deviations off of those numbers, then um, you you messed up somewhere. Uh, or you there's some you could be pulling like if you look at a topography map and you have like the only woods in like 20 square miles and you threw a ton of corn out, like you could be drawing deer from miles and miles and miles away. In which case, like that would be a, a thesis or a theme that could drive to a conclusion that would tell you like, yes, I have above average deer populations because of these factors that make sense. But that's a conversation you have yourself that makes sense looking at the data. And so we went through this uh, and for 2022 and we'll update it again. And you can see our kind of past surveys where we've done, we've been doing them now for, I don't know, God knows how long. Um, and so what you see here is for 2022, we picked up around 79 does, 68 bucks and 63 fawns. Uh, and we had cameras spread out a large, large area. We covered a lot of land in this area. And so like that works into our number. And so we have, uh, a lot of does and a lot of bucks, but shockingly, I'll show you, let's find pictures. Uh, you can kind of see this. And so for our pictures, like you can see this is, this is actually, uh, the buck that we, uh, don't make the years off on this. Trust me. Um, uh, this buck was the one that we almost shot earlier in the season and we let, well, I mean, we were going to smoke him. Like we didn't let him walk. We tried to smoke him, <laughs> but, uh, we actually tried to shoot him. Didn't get a shot. I got a shot with him much later. But I chose to let him walk at that point because uh, I think he's four and a half. You can see right here, this is a late season. They're definitely deprived. They're not had the big net. But when you see the pictures, I mean, you've seen them all over, probably social media and everywhere. But anyways, that's that 11-pointer. He made it. Uh, you can see some of the other pictures. Like, some things that I always like to focus in on, like, you don't want to overcount does. It's really hard to track, like, is this doe different from that doe? Obviously, like, if you look at the timestamps, like, that's going to tell you, yes, it's the same two does, same three does. Uh, but when the timestamps vary, but, like, you see the same patterns. Like, the deer are going to be doing things. Like, they're not walking hundreds of miles, like, come to food and then walking 100 miles back. They're staying within the same range. Like, they're they're naturally just, I don't, I don't want to say lazy animals, but they are lazy. They're going to be efficient is probably the best word to say. And so, uh, if you see the same pattern, like, every... I generally find that they do like 
90 minutes, two hour increments of feeding. So like they'll go somewhere, eat some corn, go rest and come back two hours later. It's not four deer that you saw that. It's the same two does, the same three does. They're coming in uh, and you can kind of find unique uh, identifiers. So like this one had a white spot on her head and you can kind of pick it up over the same partials uh, that tells you, yes, it's the same deer. You will find young bucks stick, uh, hanging out with does, which isn't the normal. Uh, but like if you're just hammering through hundreds and thousands of pictures, like you just, oh, I picked up five does here. Good, bam. But there's actually a small buck in the background that's not with the big bachelor pod, uh, which is this one. Same field, same area. They're hanging out with a raccoon. Probably best friends, who knows. Um, but anyways, like, and that's that big 10 pointer. Actually a long ways off, but still he's, he's, a, he's a mover. He's covering large uh, swatches of land. But anyways, big pods are forming up. Bucks are, they haven't dropped antlers which is also another big important factor to track for a late season survey is uh, you just want to know when they drop antlers so you can start looking. Uh, it makes zero sense to be walking around aimlessly uh, if, you, if, you, if all your trail camera pictures, all the deer have antlers on. Uh, maximize your efforts in, in the woods. Don't be, unless you just like walking around, which is awesome. But I don't start looking until I get pictures. Uh, I threw this one in there to show you guys. This is our, one of the deer I've been tracking for so long. Uh, he's a giant, uh, big, nice 10 pointer. Uh, he only showed up on this one picture, never once ate corn. And so I say that to tell you that I find a small percentage of bucks and they're generally bigger bucks. I generally find, uh, or more, more mature bucks, uh, don't go to corn. I don't know why, uh, they're, they just don't go to the corn. And so this guy never once touched any corn pile in any area that we were trying to capture pictures on, never once. He showed up one picture in the background moving through at that time period, um, and that was it. Uh, and so uh, it streams the importance of like, don't rely on corn as your solution for everything. Find the travel corridors, find where deer are moving and put cameras up on there they will move through there. Just because you have corn out there does not mean you're gonna draw them in. And uh, you actually may be scaring uh, mature deer away by using thrown corn into the mix. This survey says we're tracking high. 70 deer per mile is a very high density uh, of deer. I definitely, but we have a lot of food out right now. We have a lot of food plots and it definitely helps pull deer in right now when a lot of our neighbors don't have big food plots. And so I think that's driving a number. And so I don't think we're hovering at that same part. We're classic middle Tennessee, uh, hardwood timber deer, 40 deer per square mile is pretty static. Um, but the real big key factor that I've noticed that I would scream to you as you focus in on, like if you're trying to grow bucks, Biggest bucks are the oldest bucks. You want to grow them, get them older, older, older. And the best way to protect them is don't shoot them. Communicate to your neighbors like this buck, we want to let him get older. There, here he is. Be transparent with them uh, and tell them I'm trying to let, we're, we should let him walk to let him get older because he has a lot of potential. Once he becomes fair game, everyone can shoot him. Uh, but until then, uh, don't try not to. And that takes time, takes relationships to build with your, uh, neighbors and whatnot. But anyways, it, uh, I find when you're tracking survey to survey over the years, biggest impacts of deer, I see a huge drop in, uh, buck populations from one and a half to two and a half. So when one and a half to two and a half numbers, so you see right here, one and a half, in 2021, we had 25 one and a half year old bucks. Uh, we are gonna have 20, and this is a model. I'm not, I did not go through the age structure of these. Um, it's modeled off of what I've seen in the historical data. And then once we go through the age uh, classifying of our bucks, we'll try to categorize them into these categories to give us an idea. But I've done this so many times now that I have a good idea of like, you're going to lose 20 to 30 percent at least in our area in our world where i live and what i know we lose 20 to 30 percent of our bucks that are one and a half from one and a half to two and a half uh and what that tells me uh, i could pontificate i think it has a lot to do with the fact that um that's the most active breeding 
uh, they're running around like crazy. They have no idea what they're doing. They don't know what how to handle the rut. They're not prepared for the rut. Uh, and they're just running around like young bucks. I mean, that's where that term comes from. Uh, and they exhaust themselves and they run themselves into the ground. Um, they don't have the fat storage. They've not built up. They're not hitting the food sources. They're not doing what they need to do to protect themselves. And I think they literally run themselves into the ground. Uh, there's probably other fighting and whatnot, but they're the most active. And because they're the most active, they're probably going to be the most likely to die uh, out of that first gate. Uh, after that, it's pretty much a static line. We lose about 10% I found every year between the age class. 10 to 15% of the bucks die for natural mortality, um, fighting, exhaustion, uh, disease. I mean, I had one deer that we tracked that had, I think he had testic testicular cancer because his, yeah, they got massive. Uh, but that's the cool thing about when you're running career hammers, like you can see what's going on with your deer population and really set expectations around what's real and what's not. Uh, it's really cool what trail cameras have brought to the hunting world for deer hunters. Um, but I say this because if you want to shoot a, a Boone and Crockett buck, it's going to be five and a half and older. It takes five years. I mean, like to get a deer to turn five, it takes five years. Seems pretty straightforward, but that's five years that that individual buck goes from Let's look at 2022, you know, it's, he's not going to turn five in 2027. That seems crazy. Like just sit there and be that patient. And, but that, for us, I mean, that's, it's a, a lifestyle for us. I mean, that's what we do is hopefully hope, pray, uh, that they live that long and they get that big and you get the likelihood of shooting a, a big for us in middle Tennessee, a 150, 170 inch deer here is like, that's solid. Uh, we don't have the food crops like we do in the Midwest where you can get bigger and bigger, bigger deer. Uh, but that's an awesome trophy that's like once in a lifetime. So like if we can get one of those every five years, that's, that's a stud for us. Um, but it takes five years to do that. And then when you start factoring all the, every year, it's a new battle for them. Uh, make sure your neighbor or someone doesn't shoot them. Disease, fighting, like it's almost like a God's miracle that this deer lived five years and had big antlers, had the right uh, nutrition, the right levels, and the right habitat to grow this. I mean, that's why we do what we do. I mean, like, it, it is the most awesome experience to watch a deer go from, you know, one of these guys. Uh, You go from like one of these guys, young buck, small eight pointer, that could turn into, you know, 170, 160 inch trophy. I mean, that is what it's all about. And to watch that deer and to see him grow, to see him uh, come up and become a, a true world class animal, and then put a game plan together on that deer. And after watching him and being patient for five years, like, that to me is the ultimate pinnacle trophy for whitetail hunting. I mean, that's what, that's what. That's what keeps me up at night. That's what I love to do. That's my biggest passion. And uh, to help me drive to that, I use my, the data I have to model it and to make the right decisions. Because I think uh, when you look at the data in the aggregate and look over a long time period of 10 years, like you're going to find huge uh, things that you don't really factor. So like one example say we got hit with the HD 2018, 2017, 2018, that time frame totally totally wiped us out wiped us out hard um and so using that example if you lost so you know 2022 we had you know 79 70 call it 70 80 does are in sitting in this category if you lost 50 year does which is easily what we had uh, it's going to take you uh drop you down to 48 and you're going to immediately takes you another in our area, because I don't see the fawn recruitment rate that is needed to like totally immediately bounce back in middle Tennessee. I think it's just, I've, I've battled fawn recruitment so long now. Um, it's going to take you one, two, three, four, five, six, five, six years to fully come back from that. Now, um, I've talked to a lot of people that said like, after you've been hit with an EHA or a big wipeout like that, you have abundance of forage. That abundance of forage produces world-class antlers because now bucks don't have the competition for food. So there is a plus there, but no. 
it definitely takes a big hit. So if you lose a big chunk of your does, it's a long hole to crawl out for us. Um, other things, so like um, you can see right here, over here on the age class, like the goal is to get a balanced age class. But if you shoot uh, back to back years where like in your area, people are shooting a tons of does or tons of young bucks, uh, you're going to downstream impact uh, your population. So you can see like the way the data models, like you're not gonna have anything that's mature, not gonna have anything mature for the next two to three years at best uh, in that five and a half and older, like it's gonna live in that four and a half, three and a half year. Um, not to say that's the wrong thing, but just, just understand like when you shoot excess bucks for what the population is in your area, you're going to have a downstream impact on trophy animals or large antler deer running around. Um, it's just, it's gonna be, it, it makes your, instead of hunting, you know, 20 animals that are, you know, five and a half, four and a half years old, you're, you're now focusing on, in this case, when looking at the data, seven. Uh, seven bucks that kind of fit that category and just makes it much, much harder uh, and much more difficult to, to get that one mature deer. And so I think uh, for us, we always look at, you know, trying to make sure that we shoot the right deer, not the wrong deer. And we understand that, you know, what's feasible and what's not feasible. I think uh, I like to know. I like to use data to support me. Uh, it's also, you'll see, like, some of the trending graphs over here, like uh, bucks to does. Uh, this, this is not like a sliding scale. Uh, Mother Nature obviously balance it out. Like, uh, low rec fawn recruitment rate. You're going to have down seasons like EHD. Things are going to impact. Like, deer just don't grow in perpetuity. Uh, unless you have excess forage. If you have excess forage, like if you're sitting in South Georgia, you're sitting in, you know, Iowa, Wisconsin, where there's just so much food for these animals uh, that they can support that uh, population growth. I'm not going to do it. Like our deer are living off acorns uh, and like our 10 acres of soybeans here and there. Like it's just not, it's not the same thing when you have a 400 acre field of soybeans that are just allow every deer to go out there and consume all the ice cream that they want in the world. Uh, and so we try to look at that. So key takeaways I like to focus in on or tell you, like, just understand, like, most people think that you just because you have a lot of immature bucks, you're going to have a ton of mature bucks. Deer die all the time. And I'm shocked to see how much of the young bucks die. I factor in that. I also factor in 15% mortality of does. Uh, I always find dead does around. You don't really care about that, but... 15% of your does are going to die every year. At least that's what our what we've seen in our neck of the woods in Middle Tennessee. 15% of your does die every year. They don't live forever. Uh, and so that's factored into our survey and how we look at things. Uh, and then uh, for our area, fawn recruitment is 0.8. And what does that mean by 0.8? I say that for every doe, you're, she's going to have 0.8 fawns. And so, like, for this area, like, you can see right here we had... 2022, 79 does and 63 fawns. And so 63 fawns, um, not every doe is having a fawn or uh, or some does are having two fawns and some are not. Uh, and there's, there's a bunch of reasons why a deer may not have a fawn uh, and the health of that deer and whatnot. Uh, so that's just something to consider and understand when trying to look at a survey and try to make recommendations on your property and how to assess it. Uh, but a low fawn recruitment will tell you that you're naturally can't, your property can't take like one season of just shooting, hammering the deer. If you hammer the deer one season and you have a low fawn recruitment, it's gonna take a while to climb out of that. Uh, and uh, it's also an indication of population health, but I don't know, our deer are pretty healthy, I think. Um, I think that's more, it's more indicative of the genetics and how our deer live. There's just not an abundance of food. I mean, it's hardwoods, acorns. That's been the main source. 12 to 15 does is like they say maintaining a population of does. Like that just maintains the status quo. And but when you have uh, wild swings in fawn recruitment, like, I don't know. It's tough to, it's tough to just say a blanket number. Shoot 12 does, 10 does, and you're good. Um, you really have to look at the data and that's where surveys really help you. Helps you with getting to know how the deer move in your land and, and whatnot. 
Um, the other thing that is uh, a key thing is uh, just setting up the survey. We try to hit a camera for every 150 acres, 100 acres. Uh, you can go lower, uh, 80 acres, 60 acres, or um, I've asked my neighbors if I can have permission to put cameras on their lands and just promise to share the results with them and so you can get broader categories. Um, and so if you have the cameras and you have somewhat of a relationship with your neighbors, I, I totally encourage you to go out there and talk to them and ask them for permission. Say, hey, let me do a trail survey, throw some cameras out there, throw some corn out there so we can see what's going on or just ha have them do it at the same time with you and adhere to the same practices. But anyways, if you don't have 100 acres, say you have an 80 acre parcel, you can look at like how the deer are using your land and I would encourage you to put cameras on your bedding areas, your travel corridors, uh, and have more cameras and just understand like the deer aren't probably living 100% of their time on your land, but you're getting a good idea of the amount of deer moving through your land and that's definitely gonna help you with uh, transcribing what recommendations you can have for how many bucks you should be shooting, what you should be seeing and whatnot. Uh, so aim for around 100 acres per camera. If you don't have 100 acres, uh, I would definitely, if you don't have 100 acres or somewhere between that 10 acres to 100 acres, I would definitely have at least three cameras on that category. Uh, and then when you're beyond the 100 acre parcel, then I would start ramping up and, and do, you know, get a good balance. Uh, and then I would definitely run the trail camera. We ran this survey for 14 days, maybe even 20 days, 14, 20 days, depending on the camera. We struggled to maintain corn. Uh, it towards the end, once the deer really knew the corn's out there, I was putting out 50 to 100 pounds per site every three days. Uh, and I think that might have been the biggest impact of why that one deer wasn't coming in is because I was so much, uh, they could smell me, but like there's just no food out there. And so you're getting tons of deer and they're hammering the corn right now. But try not to, uh, uh, if you put out too much corn, and say like, I don't want to make a presence out there. I've noticed we're right now in the winter time, it, there's a lot of moisture, a lot of snow, a lot of ice, a lot of rain going on right now, uh, and not much foliage, not much soaking up. And so what I found when I put out like, I don't want to go out in the woods, so I'm gonna anticipate and put like 200 pounds of corn out there, it's gonna rot. It's gonna get rain on, it's gonna rot. Uh, and so like, I chose to spend more time putting corn out there and just know that it's not gonna rot, not gonna go bad. Um, and whatnot uh, with that. And so, yeah, try not to interact with it. Try to run it longer. Uh, if you run it shorter, uh, once you get into counting the does, there's a confidence interval. So like, if you run it for like 10 days, uh, they've done enough science to tell you out of UGA and whatnot that says that if you run a trail camera survey for 10 days, you're gonna find that you're gonna see 85% of your deer. So you have to factor in that 15% variance. And so that 15% variance is what takes you from, if I ran a 10 day survey, that tells me the results of their analyses of trail surveys tells you that you're gonna see only 85% of the deer. And so you're missing 15% of the deer. And so using clean numbers, uh, I have 100 deer on our property, ran a, a 10 day survey, 85 deer, we need to up our numbers to 15. Uh, for bucks, uh, it's tougher to do. I, I, I like to think and apply some history. Young bucks, I don't have a struggle with. I feel like they're gonna be hitting the corn. I will always factor in. I'm always of the believer that there's one or two monsters just sitting out there and like I just, like, I, I just have to have it in the back of my mind. Um, but I think that there's always going to be one or two mature whitetails that don't come into the area, don't come near the corn. They may be out there uh, that could help you. Uh, there's some ways, some tactics. You can run trail surveys and, and put your trail camera on like a timer. It just takes a picture every 30 seconds, every 10 seconds. And so you're going to pick up deer that are crossing a field that may never even come close to the camera, but you'll pick them up just by the time sensor taking a picture. You get a lot of pictures, but you'll definitely pick up deer that way. I've definitely been very successful with uh, planning uh, buck movement over a big field and just putting a camera out there and it takes a picture every 30 seconds, every 15 seconds. It's a ton of photos, but I can definitely find when that one deer is coming out in the field 
it may be coming from 10 different directions and like I don't have 10 different trail camera survey or 10 different trail cameras that can put at every entry point and, and know when or where he's coming in. Uh, and so I have to put it out there that captures everything and eventually I'll get find out where he, he's coming from this direction on this wind and on this direction on another wind type uh, that can help. Uh, uh, try not to shoot too many deer. Um, we are in the, you know, we love to whack deer, like that's our business. Um, but if, if your goal is to, and I say that, you know, start with the goal. What is your goal? If your goal is to have the biggest deer possible, uh, you want to have deer get older. That's just plain and simple. Everyone knows that. And so you're going to have to let deer walk and you're going to have to find ways to mitigate uh, the risk that people shoot the improper deer. Uh, the deer that we want to get older. And so the ways to do that, share pictures, talk with your neighbors, co-ops where you have a, a formal structure and how you're going to manage your deer population, which by the way, there's a lot of uh, money out there. I know Tennessee has a co-op model where they'll give you money. The state actually gives you money to help you with managing your population if you have a, a large co-op. I think Missouri has it. I think I would be surprised if like, if not every state has some form of fun or resources to help you manage your deer population if you want to take it to that next level. Um, so I would definitely encourage you scavenge the DNR websites, call the game wars, just ask them. These guys and gals want to help you uh, make the best decisions to help your wildlife. Um, and so like you could get dollars to help you do trail camera service, which is bizarre to think, but like that money sits out there. Uh, if you align your interests with what the, the overarching state agencies are trying to do with their land um, and so more pictures allows you to communicate better improve communications allows you to coordinate with your neighbors coordinate with the people hunting on your land because uh, everyone wants the same thing which is we want deer to get older to get bigger antlers uh, we want does to be healthier to produce more fawns which gives us the opportunity to produce more bucks which gives us the opportunity to get bigger bucks uh, and it all starts with looking at data and so, yes, this trail camera survey was, it was fun. Uh, there was no wild conclusions. It was pretty much, we've been doing this for 10 years now. Uh, it was very indicative of what I expected. You always hope that you're going to find that one monster buck that never showed up or never, you've never seen before. That didn't happen, but that's not the end of the world. Uh, definitely tracking. Uh, and I would encourage you to, it's always better to have more data than less data. And that helps you with working with your neighbors, working with everyone around you that uh, are aligned with your goals. And uh, so yeah, always start with the goal in mind, what you wanna do. Your goal is to get meat, get meat and find ways to improve that outcome. Your goal is to get trophy white tails, big antlers, big bones uh, with mature bucks. Then uh, that's a different set of goals that uh, we can help you with. I will try to put this on my website so that you can pull this trail camera survey and, uh, and make it user friendly. I think it's very helpful to track this year to year and also tracking to the same time period. So like comparing winter survey to winter survey. Don't compare winter survey to late summer surveys, but it helps to have this data and it's super eye-opening that you can see the, how your population, how the deer are growing or not growing and how to transcribe a, an actionable game plan to help you uh, attain your goals. Boomsy. Boomsy. Is that too much data? No, it's good data. Yeah.